Good evening. Welcome to the Wednesday night Bible study of Riverside Baptist Church. Glad you joined us this week. If you remember last week, we left Haman mortified because he was having to give praise and honor and glory to his arch enemy, Mordecai, as he led him around the streets of Shushan, clothed in the king's raiment, riding on the king's horse and saying, this is the man that the king wishes to honor and respect. That must have been a horrible, horrible pill for Haman to swallow. The only redeeming fact of the day was that he had an invitation to come with Haman or with uh, the king to the queen's palace. So let's see what happened. Will this be a great honor for Haman as he goes with the king for a second time to the queen or will it? Let's look at um, the first six verses of chapter 7 of uh, uh, Esther and uh, get a uh, kind of a running start for what we're going to be looking at this evening. Esther chapter 7, verse 1. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day at the banquet of wine, the king asked again, Esther, what is your petition? It shall be granted to you up to half the kingdom it shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I find favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given to me at my petition and the life of my people. For we have been sold by my people and I to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate the king's loss. So Ahasuerus answered and said to the queen, Esther, Who is he? And where is he? Who would dare to presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, The adversary, the enemy, is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this unfolding drama of uh, Esther and Haman, Mordecai and Ahasuerus and how all of these players are working out your plan and your purpose in their lives. Father, this is a great story of days gone by, but it has such practical application for us today. So don't let us look at it just as a mere story of the past and uh, chuckle with the humor that you give to us and uh, look at the just story of the past, but help us to apply it to today so that we might learn lessons from Haman and Esther and Mordecai and Ahasuerus that we can apply to our lives here in this 21st century. Guide us, direct us, show us your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we continue our study of Esther, we see Esther saving her people. The tables are being turned now. She is beginning that process of saving her people. The tables are turned on Haman. If you recall, Haman had an arch enemy, Mordecai, uh, who was a Jew. He wanted to hang him on the gallows because Mordecai refused to bow and pay homage to Haman. All the other people were. Haman was the second in command. He was the chief prince right up there as an advisor to the king. And he was jealous because of this Jew that would not bow or bend to him and pay homage and respect. And so he concocts this plot to kill all the Jews, which, Haman, uh, which Mordecai would have been included. So now they're back into the presence of the queen once again. And the plot is unveiled. The question is asked to Queen Esther once again by the king, what do you want? He's enticed. She, she's using some of her womanly charms, I suppose, as she has gone into the king unannounced and uninvited. She has found favor with the king. He has extended his scepter toward her. He invites her to a banquet. They go and celebrate, have a wonderful time. And the, queen, the king says, what do you want, Esther? You didn't come in here and ask for me to come to a banquet for no particular reason. What is it that you want? She said, a king, 
if I have found favor with you, how about let's doing this again tomorrow? And I'll tell you. And so the king does so. He's had a great time and he enjoys the company of the queen. So he and Haman come the second day. The second day they come in. And again, he says in verse three, what do you are in verse two? What do you want, Esther? You can have up to half of my kingdom. The same thing goes as yesterday. Up to half of my kingdom is yours. Just for the asking. And the queen responds. And this time she says, if I have found favor in your sight, if you truly love me, then grant my request and save my life. She reveals now to the king her, her, her genealogy, who, who she is, her ethnicity, that she's a Jew, that she's a part of this uh, plot to kill all of the Jews, that she would be included in that. And she says, there is a plot to kill my people, to annihilate us, to destroy us. She said, now, if I, we'd been sold into slavery, I would not have said anything. I would have held my tongue, although I, too, would have been sold into slavery, no doubt. And your loss would be so great in losing all of the Jewish people. But that's not the case, King. There is one who wants to plot against us. And all of a sudden, this day that couldn't get any worse for Haman. Remember, he's just finished that morning taking Mordecai around the streets of Shushan, riding on the horse, clothed in the king's raiment, saying, this is the man the king wants to honor. The honor that he himself wanted. Now he's having to give it to his arch enemy. He comes and says, that things have got to look up. This day has got to get better. Little does he know he is about to be thrown under the bus. When the king hears of this in verse 5, he says to Esther, Who dares make this plot against you? Who is he? Where is he? I want to know. Now, wouldn't you have liked to have been a fly on the wall once again to see the expression on Haman's face? No. He knew he was being thrown under the bus because in the first part of the sixth verse, Esther says the adversary and the enemy is the wicked Haman. Haman was terrified, it says. I'm not sure that terrified even covers it. Filled with horror, filled with terror. Yes, that, that's involved in terrified. But I would imagine that his feeling was so much greater than that. This day that Haman thought could not get any worse just got worse. Because the plot had been revealed. And from the revealing of this plot comes a very pitiful sight as Haman begins to beg for his life. In verse 7, the king is so angry that he gets up and runs out of the palace into the garden to cool off. Have you ever been so angry at something you just felt like, i got to get away? Before I say something, before I do something, before I react in the wrong way, I've got to get away. i got to cool down a little bit. And that was what the king was. Because the king realized that he had been used by Haman. Haman had come into him and given him this the story about these people who didn't abide by the rules that the king had put forth. And that wasn't a complete truth. The Jews were uh, law-abiding citizens. Now, they did keep their Jewish laws and their festivals and whatnot, but they did give their tribute to the king. They did do what was, honor, what was supposed to be honoring to the king. But Haman was so consumed with resentment and bitterness for one man, Mordecai, that he was willing to use the king. The king realizes this, and now his wrath has become so great that he leaves in order to cool down. When the king leaves, Haman stays right where he is. Now, possibly, Haman should have run himself all the way out of Shushan to the farthest part of the country that he could run to, but he didn't. He appeals to Esther. 
he pleads for his life in verse 7 as the king leaves Haman stays and in verse 8 or the last part of verse 7 Haman stood before the queen pleading for his life for he saw that evil was determined upon him against by him against the king he was pleading for his life pleading that she would intercede on his behalf and and tell the king how sorry he was and and that he would do something you know, he would do penance when the king returned however into the room Mordecai in our Haman brother in his distress had fallen across the couch begging and pleading the queen to intercede on his behalf and so when the king comes back in he finds Haman laying across the queen on the couch <laughs> things are getting worse for Haman because the king says will he also assault the queen while I'm in the house and as the words left his mouth one of the eunuchs there, Habona, said to the king, Look, king, just outside Haman's house stands a gallows 75 feet high. It was the gallows that Haman intended to hang Mordecai on. And the king says, Good, go hang this man on that scaffolding. I have a book in my office called Alexander's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Alexander's a young boy who wakes up one morning and he knows things are not going to be good that day because he wakes up and there's gum in his hair. It gets worse. His best friend deserted him. There was no dessert in his lunch bag. And on top of all that, they had llama beans for supper and there was kissing on TV. Alexander decides... He's going to run away to Australia. And throughout the whole book, things get worse and worse and worse for Alexander. Well, that must have been the way that Haman was feeling. And Haman may have thought about running away somewhere else, but there was nowhere else to run. The king's reaches went far and wide. And this day that started out bad went to worse. And Haman is put on the gallows. The plans change for him. In verse 10, uh, or, or the, well, actually the last part of verse 9, they hung Haman on the gallows. This 75 foot high gallows that Haman had built for Mordecai, so that everybody in the city could see, looking up, they could see the body of, Ham of Mordecai swinging on the gallows. And so they would know, you'd better give homage. To Haman. Now the tables are turned. The plans have changed. And Haman is the one who's swinging on the gallows. And everyone in the whole city can see Haman there. And he becomes the spectacle instead of being the one who produces the spectacle. And when he is hung, verse 10 says, the king's wrath subsided. The king settled down. His wrath abated because this one who had sought to kill all of the Jews had now himself been put to death. I believe the lesson that we can take away from this tonight is what we have been saying all through this study. Resentment hurts you a lot more than it hurts the intended target. If you're holding bitterness and resentment in your heart towards anyone, maybe a family member, could be a boss, someone at work, a neighbor, some friend that you had in the past that you think has done you wrong, and you're holding resentment against that person, take it from Haman. It's going to hurt you a lot more than it's going to hurt the intended target that you're looking at. That person or persons may not even know that you hold resentment against them. It's not affecting them, most likely, at all. But it's eating away at you like a cancer. 
little bit by little bit, and sometimes in great gulps, it's eating away at you and causing you to be less than what you ought to be. Don't let resentment rule in your life. Let God have his way. God has a plan. And when his plan works, it's a lot better than our resentment. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this story of Esther, all the twists and the turns, because it helps us to understand how we think and, and how our minds go immediately toward getting even, and yet sometimes that comes around like a boomerang and gets us. Most likely it eats away at us more so than it does our intended target. So help us to understand the importance of forgiveness. It's not an easy thing to do, but help us to do that and to live our life resentment-free, giving all of our problems, all of our difficulties, all of our struggles to you. Help us and guide us and direct us. Keep us safe until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.